Hello, my name is Ian Hayden-Smith, and I'd like to welcome you to this BFI at Home event. For the last four decades, Oliver Stone has established himself as one of Hollywood's preeminent iconoclasts, a filmmaker whose work has questioned the legitimacy of established historical narratives and examined shifts in political and popular culture. He's been lionized and demonized in equal measure and created a kind of cinema in both theme and tone that is very much his own. And now, with the publication of Chasing the Light, Oliver Stone has turned his focus towards his own life. His compelling memoir charts his story from his parents' past, a youth divided between France and the USA and serving in Vietnam, through to his entry into the film world and up to the night he walked on stage at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion in LA to accept the Best Director Oscar for Platoon. Uh, welcome, Oliver Stone, to this virtual BFI event. Thank you, Ian. It's nice to be here. And congratulations on your memoir. Yeah, that's uh, that's important to me. It's sort of like I, I finally get to tell my story straight the way I see it. That's not necessarily the truth, but it certainly it corrects an, uh, some mistaken ideas and notions about me. So it's a it's kind of important in my life. I want to come to the earlier parts of your life in a moment, but um, first of all, looking over the course of the last 20 years, since 2000, you've made six features. You've presented a series of documentaries that focus on international political figures, many of whom stand in stark contrast to US policy. You've also collaborated with Peter Kuznick on the TV series and subsequent book, The Untold History of the United States. And now you've turned to uh, focus on your own life. Uh, at what point in time did you decide that, that you wanted to write this book? It's a good question. Uh, it, I consider the work from 2000 an outgrowth of what was said, what was done earlier. I was, leaning in, I was leaning in that direction. As you know, politically, I was very conservative when my father raised me that way, my mother too. And as the years went and my experiences grew, I became... Uh, let's say more progressive and more thoughtful about my existence as well as the world's existence. And you realize that in 2001, the country, America changed for the worse. <laughs> it, we suddenly had, a, we had a worse president than we have now, but it was called Bush. And he, he set the country on another tonality that I had, I lamented. I thought it was an overreaction to terrorism was suddenly our biggest enemy and so forth and so on. We lost sight of our goals. We lost sight of our constitution and our rights. So the country has drifted for 20 years into this mass of insanity, I think, close to insanity and breakdown. So it was necessary to respond to it. And I did respond as people kind of counted me out. They say, oh, Stone never, never wanted to go, never did enough features. He never scored a big hit, popular hit again. That's not quite true, but the point was that I was addressing it. I was trying to be up to date and I wasn't, I cared the most of all about where we we're going. So I made films right about the situations. I finally made W in 2008, the movie about Bush, the movie ended in 2004, remember. It wasn't contemporary like that way. And I also made a movie about World Trade Center, which was about the, the meltdown on 2001. And it was specifically about that disaster there. And the, and the reactions of the firefighters and, and so forth, and the rescuers. So the, I was really uh, uh, trying to stay in, on the pulse of things. And then I went on to the, uh, to the stock market changes that occurred since the old Wall Street. That is to say, from 2008, the, this meltdown that happened was significant because it was a big new step on Wall Street in another worse direction. That was called uh, Wall Street Money Never Sleeps. And then I did, as a feature, I did the, uh, the drug wars with savages and then Snowden, which was very contemporary and nothing since. Uh, there's a reason for that. I spent a lot of time on those documentaries, particularly untold history of the United States. I had to go back to school for that. Studied history with Peter Kuznick, who's a professor at American University and a, and a, and a liberal of the old school new American history inside out and brought me to a new perspective. You see, I never had gone to, I never studied history in college. I was, as you know, a film student, which is not quite the same thing. So I went back and I really got involved in this project for five years. It means a lot to me. It's 12 hours long. We, we sold it in Britain and we sold it all over the United States. It did very well. It's still on, actually it's still on Netflix and was one of the highest volume uh, seen films. 
uh, in uh, a very important film for young people to especially to see about our history. It's an alternative view of what of the events that happened since 1898 up to Obama in 2013. So I, I as far as I'm concerned, I stayed busy and involved. Uh, but that's perhaps not the perception that people who are superficial would, would say, because, you know, I wasn't making a film a year or two films every three years or something like that. I wasn't into that routine because I got tired of making films. I mean, I got tired of the process. It's a, it's a hard process and, and it's only worth it to me if you really have something to say or do about, you just can't make a film to make money. I, I didn't, I made enough money and I wasn't worried about that. What was the uh, question again? I forgot. I, um, just the, the, when you decided that you wanted to write this book amongst the documentaries you were making. Oh, oh yeah, okay. Well, listen, I was trying to set my accounts in order and I was ha having been very vastly misunderstood, at least in my country for a long time. I felt the need to, to state my case, to say who I am. And I could only go as far as 1986 in this book up to the success of Platoon, because that's where the story really ends. I did achieve the success I wanted as a writer and as a director, and it was a huge, huge success. So I went around the world, made a fortune. Critics loved it, which is rare for me. And uh, we got an Academy Award on top of it, my God. And the BFI, actually a BFI Institute uh, gave us an award. So there was nothing better than, than Platoon and Salvador coming together, one on, one on top of the other. And that's where I thought, after 300 and some pages, that's enough for this book. And some people have faulted me for that. They said I should have gone all the way through, but I think my story was told there in that book, the beginning of the story, up to 40 years old. Now there's another life, completely another life after that. And I, I can discuss some of it with you because you're gonna ask me maybe about my films, but frankly, the book achieved my purpose. The book, the book opens, the introduction of the book opens on the set of Salvador and the stunning sequence of a Santa Ana battle. And I just wondered, is it moments like that with their excitement and their energy, a primary reason why you're a filmmaker or perhaps a moments like that, a payoff for all the pain involved in to actually getting to that point? Uh, that's a good question also. I mean, yeah, it was the kid in me. That's what I was addressing. I was saying the child in me in this crazy scene where the cavalry charge down a street in San Salvador, not in San Salvador, it was another city, but it was just the height of kind of a boyish illusion. I'd want, I'd be, you know, when I love cowboys and Indians and stuff. So it was a charge I went on horseback. My God, that's what movie makers do. I wanted spectacle. I wanted big things to happen. I was a kid back then, but obviously it's not the reason you make movies because I made, a lot of my movies are interior and to, they, they have a lot of, sometimes a lot of verbal dialogue. So it's not just that. I mean, it is a story, deliver the story. And I've been struggling always to, to make the thing exciting to follow as opposed to, uh, well, as a kid, I always, you know, there's, I had two categories, you know, boring or not boring. And uh, it wasn't, I was never uh, uh, inclined towards the, the talky stuff until later in my life. And I, I appreciate it now much more. The, um, the books after that introduction then shifts back in time to tell your parents' story. Um, but there's a moment that really fascinates me that you keep returning to in the early stages of your book. And that's you in New York on Independence Day in 1976, the 200th anniversary of America. And it feels weighted with both, both personal and national significance. And I was just wondering, was this a time that you just recalled specifically for this book, or is it a moment that has proven significant throughout your life? It's one of those moments, Ian, that you kind of never forget. I don't know about you, but I have, we have consciousness in moments, it's things that happen along the way. And for some reason, you remember some silly image from a walk in the park, and you remember that image from 40 years ago. Why? It's just a sky and squirrels or something, but it lodged in your consciousness in some weird way that persists. That's happened to me a lot and I have many images, but that day specifically felt like the right start point for a book because as in a good novel or a good movie, the character would move from poverty and despair to some kind of success, like an old Horatio Alger, uh, Charles Dickens tale, which I love those kind of things. 
And in 1976, I was flat broke. I had just left my, my wife and I had just broken up. And I had barely, a, you know, 20 bucks in my pocket. And I was living on the edge, but I was excited. It was exciting. It was very exciting. And, uh, you know, uh, money can't buy poverty. That's the thing. As I said in the book, it just teaches you a lot. And I was learning. And But that day, that night, with the 70, 1976 was the 200th anniversary and the American country was celebrating its its birth. And of course, it made me think about what I, my life had reached this place at 30 where I had failed. And I had to deal with that failure. And watching those boats on the river there in the East River, I could remember very vividly my mother coming to this country as an immigrant 30, uh, in 1946, 30 years before. And uh, I started to tell the story of my mother and my father and how he was a soldier in World War II. And he, he met her in Europe and he married her. And I don't think that they were ever meant for each other because I don't think they really knew each other at that point. But that was the nature of that time. And they gave birth to me. I was the only child. So it's a strange fate. I inherited the destiny that I, I felt like I inherited the destiny that was somehow tied to the American experience, which of immigration post-World War II. And that's when it starts. The American in my view, the American degeneration, I call that seriously a degeneration starts at that time. When we take over the mantle of the world and we say we are gonna protect against uh, tyrannies that we saw in World War II. Uh, and we are, we are gonna be the solver of these problems, the policemen of the world. It turned into much more than that after 1945 much more. It starts with the atomic bomb, and then it becomes a series of establishing our muscle everywhere. And for me, it culminates at that point in the book with the Vietnam War in 1960s, to which I go as an unwitting participant. And I learn a lesson from that experience that marks my life. And then, of course, the book goes into the experience of making platoon, as well as the experience of Salvador being about a civil wars in the Central Americas that the United States were very heavily involved with. We were supporting the bad guys in various countries, Salvador, Nicaragua, Guatemala, uh, uh, Honduras. And I, in those countries, I saw the same beat of war, the same madness that I saw in Vietnam. That's undeniable because it's coming into your personal experience in front of your eyes. When you feel that and know that, you can't lie to yourself. There's something wrong with this system that does that. Why are we supporting these horrible death squad people who are killing people who really want reform in their countries? They're not communists in that way. They're just people who want reform, better lives. And it's still the case. We do want better lives all over the world. In America, too, it's because the war has come home. People are asking for better lives, a better quality of life. They're not making enough. They're not having enough of a too many taxes are going to the preparation for war. All these problems have gotten worse and more magnified. And uh, unfortunately, no, they have not been solved. And the atomic problem has even grown worse with the nuclear problem of, of you know, end of the world uh, syndrome, which we're thinking about too, very seriously sometimes uh, with our limited new approaches to limited nuclear warfare. Those. Uh, I don't know where I started the answer, but where did you start the question? Just, just, just thinking about Salvador. Um, that was the first of your films that I actually saw in the cinema. I just hit the age where I was allowed to go and see it. Um, and I've subsequently watched, I think, pretty much every single film that you've made since in the cinema. Um, and it, it, I watched Salvador again, again the other day. And James Wood's speech to the two CIA officers in the garden party stunned me because it's lost none of its relevance. And the only thing that, that, that had me wondering watching it again the other day is would that speech be allowed in a film today? I know people say that there's more freedom in film, you can say what you want, but with certain top topics, I do wonder, because we're talking about a film that did get a wide release. It was in some mainstream cinemas. Yeah, it didn't get a wide release. It got a limited release a limited in release. art theaters and so forth. We never did much business until later when the video came out and the video took off because all of a sudden it was, it did find a standing, a, a respect. 
So the at the first release was it was unfortunate, and it was and it's I discuss it in the book yeah. because I was trying to make platoon at the time, and it was a very hard go. But you know that speech was barely was resisted. It was not easy to make back then because that speech was considered oh you're preaching at us, and I knew that to a certain degree. I expect I said yeah I know, but you know this may be my last film because I'd been there before with a lot of my stuff had been censored in the earlier scripts uh, for uh, uh, for Scarface and for for certainly on Scarface and on Midnight Express, two things were changed. But here was my chance. I'm making the movie. This is my movie. I want to make it my way. And I may never make it again, but at least on my tombstone, you'll know these were my feelings about our policy in Central America. Of course, it's a speech, but you know, like Patty Chayefsky said, sometimes you just got to make that speech because it's on your, it's, it's boiling in your chest. And if you don't get it out, uh, you'll never get it out. That's why I did it. Unfortunately, uh, I do. Whether your question of whether that would be allowed today, I think a certain way you could get away with it is like Aaron Sorkin gets away with it. He does get away with some very interesting speeches. But he's smart. But I basically, you cannot make films in the United States get them financed so that are critical of the military empire that we have established around the world. The bases all over the world. You can't go into that. You can't investigate that and show the evil it does to the world because they're not ready to hear that message in this country. And that's one of the major policy points. If you'll notice in the presidential elections from any year, they cut off the candidates who talk about that, whether it's a Tulsi Gabbard or whether it's a Jill Stein back in 2016, they don't allow these candidates except as third party alternatives. That's the problem. And that's true in film too. You can't go into the military industrial empire in any depth. In Hollywood, there's a new book that was written in 2017 called National Security Cinema by Matthew, Matthew Alfred. Are you aware of it? I'm aware of it, yeah. Oh, it's a very good book. And he lists, I believe, 800 plus films that have been influenced by the Pentagon or the CIA. And on television shows, it's more than that. It's like hundreds. It's quite a fascinating read. And I would suggest it to anyone who really just detests censorship. To, uh, to You have to understand, you don't get any money from this, you don't get equipment, you don't get men, you don't get anything from uh, without giving their, giving the Pentagon and the CIA, giving their approval specifically to your script, which means they read it and they go line by line. That's the system. So I, my film was only made because of John Daly. John Daly is an English independent who's, in my mind, is a hero from your country who didn't give a shit. He fought, a, he, he, he was a tough, lower class Cockney, and he had that attitude, the right attitude about the bullshit. A moment in um, Salvador, like the moment you experience and talk about uh, on Independence Day 1976, engages with the notion that you've dealt with in your, your films, your documentaries and your writings, American exception, exceptionalism. And there's a line in your book related to that, that that really fascinated me when you talk about your films as shock absorbers marching me through the decades of an intense almost insane American experience just thinking about your work from Salvador onwards did you see yourself in a way as a, a sort of conduit to channel ideas and and provoke people to think about things that they might either not think about generally or might just not exist on their radar. Well, certainly that happened in this case. And I, you know, uh, Central America and, and Latin American projects in American cinema have not done well across the board. Going back, Missing was a beautiful film made in 1982 by Costa Gavras. I loved it, but it just didn't score in this country. You couldn't criticize this country's involvement in foreign countries in Chile in that matter, or in Salvador, it wasn't done. I was lauded, you know, by the way, this Salvador was a, a dilettante hit at, at first. It was something, I was invited by the way, to the BFI in London. I remember that it was one of the most exciting experiences in my young life at that point. And they had a full audience there, you know, several hundred people. They loved Salvador in, at the BFI. And I, you should, you could get a tape of that, but it was a nice, in other words, I was lauded by people who were on in the battle on Central America. There was a lot of resistance. Uh, the, certainly the Sandinistas were popular in England and in America and various countries in Europe. But uh, it died out over time because all those wars in Central America, 
they won. I mean, the U.S. won basically indirectly cheating, all that kind of stuff. And except for Venezuela and Cuba at this point and Nicaragua, nobody's holding out. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a long term battle with the empire, a long term battle. It was a heavy mantle to carry. Yeah, I felt it. I felt, yeah, he's a, he's a new guy on town. He's saying things. Yes, I definitely felt excited and above all supported by a, a strong coterie of people because there were, there was that at the time. Now, I used it to, of course, make Platoon and Platoon then opened real doors for me, big doors. And all of a sudden I did have access, carte blanche to the, to the industry. And looking at that carte blanche from Wall Street onwards, going through a series of extraordinary films that you made in the 1990s, do you think that you would be able to get many of those made today? Because, I mean, these were not small budget films that you moved on to. And in terms of tone, the radical style that you approached and adopted is, is just quite amazing. Well, the, the, the zeitgeist has changed. I mean, since 2001, as I said earlier, the attitude is that America is besieged, which I think is nonsense, but America besieged by enemies and we have to support the American flag. And it's changed the, the, the zeitgeist, it's moved. But at that time, uh, like any filmmaker who has certain color or a certain panache and do, did respectable business at the box office, I was wildly supported by in making these films. So I could go in on anything pretty much. And I did, I used my power. I, Wall Street was not popular as a subject matter. There had been very few business films. One made by Jane Fonda had flopped a uh, rollover. And there had been a film back in 1950s that was great called Executive Suite. I mentioned it at the time from Robert Wise. I loved that film and I got to know Robert and modeled, modeled that. Ernie Lehman wrote the screenplay. It was really beautiful. And I wanted to do that kind of movie and I did it. And dad, my father was, of course, in Wall Street. So it was also, but he was no longer alive. It was paying homage to an old Wall Street that was changing clearly into a new game in 87. Uh, the picture did okay. It did well. It grew later into a, a, a classic, I could say, but it was not at the time when it came out. It was criticized roundly by critics. Uh, and then after that, I used the power. It kept rolling. I did talk radio. Nobody wanted to talk about the, the birth of right wing, right wing uh, sh radio hosts back in those days. But that was a hell of a movie. And, and then I moved right into Born on the Fourth of July, and nobody resisted that except for the money. It was tight. Tom Cruise is a star. You can't say no to Tom or to me. And we got it done at a price, you know, at a price. Uh, it was $17 million a, for a story about a cripple, which nobody wanted to see until we made the movie. And then they understood the movie. And it was a big hit. Big hit. Still plays huge royalties to me. I get, I'm very happy with Born on the Fourth of July. And one thing after another. And then, of course, it leads to the greatest protest of all, which I get into trouble for, which is JFK. I think you know the story there. I was never the hero after that. Um, just coming back to uh, Born on the Fourth of July, um, it's always interesting when I read uh, memoirs by filmmakers where I'm, I'm looking for the sort of autobiographical elements in their films. And it was really interesting to hear you talking about the time you spent in Mexico coming back from Vietnam yourself and then watching born on the 4th of July again, and seeing that sequence in Mexico, which at the time I saw it was one of my favorite scenes in the film. There was something that just felt so authentic and, and incredibly real about those scenes. And I'm just curious how much of those scenes were Ron Kovic's as opposed to yours? Or was it a case of both feeding into them? No, the, uh, it's definitely Ron Kovic's story. And I stuck to that story and Ron was extremely helpful. He was my co-writer. And he has a, a kind. Of, he has a strange. He has a very strong memory for for these for specific moments, and he was excellent in describing it, and even in, in giving me some form of the dialogue. He was my true co-partner on this, and without him, I, I don't know if I would have had the confidence to undertake such a tough story. My my background in Mexico was seedy and like Ron's was experience and there were similar parallels and I used them and at least in the back of my mind as color and I I knew where I wanted to go with the Mexico stuff but I wanted to get him through hell and back to the United States which was where the story and has to resolve back in his homeland. 
And I know one can go um, quite a long way with parallels between a filmmaker and, and the work they produce. Um, but throughout your book, you're incredibly frank about your parents' relationship and also your relationship with your parents. And um, I think Wall Street was the first film I ever saw where someone had dedicated the film to their father, your father, Lewis Stone. Um, and I'd assumed at the time that the Martin Sheen character you had based on your father. But then when I read the book, I wondered if, at least on a professional level, um, Jim Garrison might have been slightly closer. Just the way you spoke about him in terms of his work ethic yeah. and a specific kind of dedication. Specifically, uh, my father was, mo I modeled both Hal Holbrook, the broker, as well as Martin Sheen on my dad. My dad was never a working man, laborer. He was always a white collar uh, executive, not executive as much as a, he was a thinker, a writer, an economist. He wrote beautifully about economics and he had a monthly letter. I respected him deeply. He was a smart man. He was an authority figure and I, he was the center of my life. Uh, but I loved him for his honesty because he would always say what he thought, not, not that he was right, but what he thought. And I found that to be reasonable. In other words, when he always liked Eisenhower, I don't know why, but Eisenhower was, and Nixon too, to a degree, but you know, Rockefeller, he, he was ingrained in the system. And I wrote in the book about how the system betrayed him in the end because it's a strange fate. He worked hard all his life, but he ended up kind of at the dead even, you know, with the deaths. And it's, it's the typical story of people who get crushed by this wheel, this capitalist wheel. At the same time, he would not complain because he had a good life. And he had a good life and he gave us a good life and he gave me an education. Uh, but when it comes to Jim Garrison, I never thought of that connection because dad was not at all a protester. He was not at all. He was contemptuous of people like the hippies, as I pointed out, people who were protesting the war of, in Vietnam. He couldn't understand that. And yet, at the end of his life, when he was past 70, I, can, I saw the change more, much more tolerant. He knew the Russians were not out to get us. He knew it was a pile of baloney. And, and uh, he said it. Thank God he said it. But it was too late. He'd, he'd already written his stuff, and he, no one was listening to him at that point. Anyway, Jim Garrison was a real patriot, as I tried to point out in the movie. I remember him vividly. He was in World War II. He was in, back in Korea. They tried to, they, they, they painted him as a scoundrel in the most awful ways you can imagine. Uh, I've never read worse stuff written about a person. And knowing him personally and knowing the work and the dedication, it was just shocking. And it gave me, of course, a vision, a view of what was going to happen possibly to people like me, which is scary. You don't want to be considered that way and, and and I have run into those those rocks a few times but Jim really cared about the country he's a real patriot and he was right as far as I'm concerned in the things he was saying he didn't have the whole truth he had pieces of the truth and he did the best to try to undo them now he had flaws absolutely we all have flaws and people never forgave him for anything the press went after him in a horrible way horrible way uh, with just a lot of lies and slander that today would be recognized right away because of social media. I think there'd be much more resistance and, and support for him, but he still achieved a lot. And people don't understand that his trial, although it was a flawed trial, resulted in much information getting out into the public, including the Zapruder film. And again, it's, it's that, that sense of demonization is something that was then leveled at you with your film. And you, you kind of think with Seymour Hersh's The Dark Side of Camelot, with more stories coming about, coming out about Kendi, you kind of think would people be more open to a different interpretation. But I remember the rancor at the time was, was quite extraordinary. It was extraordinary. Major media laid into the film. I don't know why you mentioned Cy Hirsch's book, because it's the worst book on Kennedy. It's, <laughs> it's not exactly accurate either. It's been discredited. But it's a provocation, I guess. Yeah, but Kennedy always fascinated people, and he had a sex life, and he, he was a human being, and I kind of like him for it. But what people have forgotten in all this, and that's why I'm one of my projects I'm almost finished with is this four-hour documentary called J JFK Destiny Betrayed. The idea here is to give all the facts that have accrued since the movie came out that have been ignored and buried. And these are a lot of facts about Kennedy 
and what he was doing in those years before he was killed. We don't know enough about that because people write about him in this faintly suspicious rich kid way that he was going to go into Vietnam and he was going to do this and do that. Everything in his, everything he did, we can show was, a, was of a, he had to accommodate to the public relations of his time, which demanded a Cold War, but he was really a progressive thinker. And so did not, uh, his, peace, his peace speech, it's one of the most heartfelt speeches of all time, one great speech, and also a civil rights speech that he gave. There's various things that Kennedy is not known for that he should be known for. And I hope my documentary comes out in this censored world. That's going to be another issue because it may end up in who knows where, maybe in England. So. I want to return to another early moment in the book that I felt had a sense of importance, which is the second time that you chose to leave Yale, and this time for good. Thinking back on it and the, the person that you were then, did thinking about that decision sort of surprise you in any way? Or were you already at that point in time, what you call yourself in your introduction, a provocative personality? No, 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 not at that point at all. I was a conformist and I was, it was a very painful, painful time for me. I just, I remember the shadow of this book, A Child's Night Dream, which was haunting me. It was just, it was consuming me and I wanted to be, I wanted to know my direction in life. I, don't know, I wanted to, if you read the book, you'll understand that I was really looking trying to understand. And this book was that effort. So I, I, I saw my life as that book at that point. And when that book was rejected, it broke me up. I had no interest in school or Yale or all those people. I didn't want to be part of the East Coast establishment. I, 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 maybe I wasn't good enough. I would have, I don't know, but I know where those, those kids were going and they all did pretty much. Um, most of them, uh, I don't agree with it. I just don't agree with our country's attitude with our establishment. They think that they're doing the right thing, but they're the Atlantic, they're the global generation. They see the world. They're globalists. America is everywhere. It's a nice idea for peace, but it doesn't work that way. We've given more wars to the world and more misery than we've taken. So uh, that whole generation is betrayed in my prayer and has betrayed itself, has betrayed the country without knowing it. Most of them don't have a clue of what I'm talking about. And this sense of outrage, do you feel that th this is now much more powerfully or better expressed through documentary? Because you have made so many documentaries over the course of the last two decades. Yes, I have. And they have not been taken seriously in this country. It's amazing. Until history has no reviews, hardly, except from progressive historians. The mainstream just ignores it. And that's what the mainstream has been doing, increasingly ignoring things that they don't want to encounter, that they don't want to know, whether it's Trump or whatever it is. They just they, they have a way of censoring bad news. To, and this is a disaster for our country, but our media has changed, too. It's become much louder and certainly more corrupt. Although it was pretty corrupt then. And that's not, let's be honest, the establishment was well established in World War II. It's, it's, it's quite interesting looking at the way that you've been perceived over time. If, if you look at your screenwriting with um, uh, Midnight Express going into Scarface um, and Year of the Dragon, and you are this right-wing demagogue, and suddenly within the course of a few years, you're, you're this left-wing liberal. It is, it is quite amazing how the, the tide has turned in perceptions of you over time. People need categories. They need. They don't think about you very much. They think about you for 15 seconds here or 10 seconds there. And of course, they need a classification. And that's very dangerous. And we should not do it in our lives, but we do it. It, it, it happened and it was frustrating for me because I was not that. I was not a demagogue. I was not a xenophobe. I, I had traveled a lot of the world already. I was zealous to a degree, as I said, when I came back from the war. I wanted the, my pictures to be violent because I had seen the violence over there and I wanted to reflect it accurately, realistically, not phony violence like I was seeing in the Vietnam movies. I wanted real violence. I wanted people to die on screen. So I went out of my way on all these movies to really push reality, realism, and perhaps I'm sure I went too far at times and it offended people. Certainly on Year of the Dragon, I felt that there was a tug on me that was pulling me in the wrong direction. And Conan the Barbarian was silly, but uh, for me, it was silly. 
uh, not what the original script was, which was a magnificent script about, a, a tw it could have been a 12 part series, a movie, a 12, 12, it could have been a James Bond franchise. I would have been rich, <laughs> but it didn't happen that way because of, as I wrote about Dino De Laurentiis saying, he had another vision. Uh, so did John Millius, but. Just thinking what you said about Platoon. Again, this is a film I saw when I was 16. Platoon? And, yep. And obviously with my grandfather, I'd watched the Green Berets years before. And um, I'm not sure at that point in time if I'd seen Coming Home, but I had seen The Deer Hunter. I had seen Apocalypse Now. And with the exception of Lawrence Fishburne, everyone in these films looked really old. And suddenly I'm seeing this film in the cinema with a group of guys who looked two years, three years older than me. And it, I, I found it genuinely shocking at the time to, mm. to come out and think, first of all, it felt like a very recent history. And for some strange reason, the other films felt like the distant past. Very and interesting. Did that. Had this sense of being here and now. But it was a shock. You have a film suddenly where people, young men who actually did go to war, are, are the people you're seeing on the screen. We went deliberately tried to do that because that was what I saw over there. And uh, people, we took great pains to make everything realistic. The, the, the faces, the fatigue, the dirt, what it was like just to, to stay out in the field overnight, you know, just to give you those tedious examples of what happens. And I think people bought into that. And they, certainly the veterans recognized it. And they said, many of them said it was the most realistic version of Vietnam they'd ever seen. Nothing close to Chuck Norris or, or Stallone. I mean, they're, these, they were the people that were perverting, perverting the truth, perverting history, undermining life in the sense that it was making war into a game of fantasy and, and people are killed, but no big deal because we have a sense of redemptive violence here. This is, you have the right to kill because you've been injured or you've been crossed or your people have been crossed. There's always a revenge factor. It's disgusting and it goes on still today. It goes on and on. And it's gotten, again, bad because the military pictures are a joke in my opinion. And no matter, and technically well done, what, it doesn't matter to me, uh, that, but the, 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 the message is what's wrong. The feeling is that America is owed this, that it has the right to do this. It doesn't, under no God, under no, commandment would, to, would we have the right to do what we've done in the world these last 70 years around half of the book details the making of salvador and platoon and i, I challenge anyone to read that book and and not think that you you have such determination and drive to be able to get through that. And you've already mentioned um, John Daly, who is an extraordinary person. But thinking back to the 1980s, and you have critics and as well as filmmakers such Quentin Tarantino uh, talking about the 80s were a bad time in American film. Did you feel like you were swimming against a tide in Hollywood by making films such as Salvador and Platoon? No, I, I didn't. I mean, that's a hindsight. To say that all the 80s is, is bad is, is crazy. It's any more so than saying all the 70s are good. There are good films and there's bad films every year. It's a, it's a, it's a formula that keeps appearing over and over again. I, there are many films in the 80s that are special, uh, and, but special in a different way. There was a feeling, I would say, alt, generally of an optimism that was not there in the 70s because in the 70s, the country was perceived to be going downhill and into poverty and there was all kinds of contention and Jimmy Carter's regime did not work out the way people had hoped and the 70s films are depressing sometimes, but they're good. You watch them, they're very interesting. The Coming Home's an interesting movie. It may not have made a dime, but it's interesting. And in the 80s, I guess it was more of the feel good uh, Reagan era, but that doesn't mean there were not movies that were trying to say something such as Missing, such as my movie, Salvador, such as Platoon. Uh, and then I, well, I mean, I, what is Wall Street? It's, it's about a more realistic Wall Street, frankly, than what people knew about. They think, oh, Wall Street, they don't have a clue what they do in Wall Street. The point was we try to explain it. What was Wall Street for? It's not just an evil machine. It was, as Hal Holbrook said, my father would say, it's an engine for industry and research. It's a major place for American productivity. But that doesn't come through anymore because of all the idiots that have 
distorted Wall Street with the you know grotesque interpretations of what money can do. What you have in Platoon, you have in Wall Street, you've got Barnes uh, in Platoon, obviously Gordon Gecko in Wall Street. A series of characters, and you, you can look in later films, that explore your ideas about America. Um, there's obviously on one level the, the love of violence, or the US, not America, the love of violence. Um, but also the very fact that Gordon Gecko who is the villain of the piece, should become a hero for a large contingent of people. Um, likewise, Mickey and Mallory um, is, is fascinating. Yes, it is. They're different. It's different movies, different messages in a sense. Yes, in Gordon Gecko's case, they completely misunderstood that. I mean, the guy was a slick and dangerous operator who was, didn't give a shit about anybody else except making money. He does resemble Donald Trump in many ways. And, and I think Trump liked him and modeled himself after him. And certainly Charlie is supposed to be the hero of the film. Perhaps Charlie was not as strong enough as an actor to make that point, but it's never easy to play the virtuous role. But that was supposed to be sort of a pilgrim's progress. The boy comes to realize that his values are corrupted by this man. And he likes, and he goes back to his father. His father is an honest man, a labor union leader who's, screwed over by, 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 by Gordon Gekko. And he understands, he has to understand. And he go, that's the movie ends on a high note of a hope note, put it this way, of the boy waking up and going on in his life. And then uh, in the other case, it was different because they, they actually, Mickey and Mallory, in my view of it, the movie, Natural Born Killers, were the heroes because they were less bad than the, the media guy, Robert Downey, than Jack Scagnetti uh, character who kills people, he's a cop, or by the warden of the prison, uh, Tommy Lee Jones. So when I said that, that's, people don't understand it. Yeah, they were bad in the sense of, on an absolute scale, but on a relative scale, no. The system is worse than they are. Question about the psychological cost of filmmaking. Um, your description of the funding and making of Salvador comes across like a cross between The Bad and the Beautiful, Eight and a Half, and Dennis Hopper's The Last Movie. Had you known what lay in store, do you think you might have remained a writer? Or is there still I, something that pulled? I would have crawled through the desert and starved half to death, and I would have done anything, sell my mother to make a movie. I don't know what it was. I was... I was, uh, I had to make a movie before I died <laughs> and I did. And you know, it was a crazy venture to begin with because Richard Boyle, who my, was my co-writer and my friend was a journalist, uh, agreed. He was like a, a half a journalist or whatever. He was a bit of a, a Hunter Thompson type quite a bit. And he flew by the seat of his pants. He took me down to this country. I didn't know from Adam and put me in the middle of a of civil war there and said, well, we're gonna get the government to make the film with us in the middle of a soul, which is a crazy idea. I mean, the government was gonna finance our helicopters and all that, and then we'd shoot the rest of the movie in Mexico and show the good guys on the other side. That was a nutty idea, but I was believed it, and I thought we could pull it off until our advisor got, was shot down. Uh, it looked like we might be able to do it. What a crazy story. And, and finally, and I know this is a question I, I'm, I'm sure most people wouldn't want to be asked, but, um, you, you, talk, you end the book on the pinnacle of, of winning the Oscar for oh. Platoon and then Platoon collects the, the, the best film. Um, looking across at the whole of, of your career, is, is there one film that you hold more dear than all the others? Not on a qualitative basis, but, but something that you just hold close to your heart. Oh, they all are. Come on. <laughs> when you live in a film for a year, year and a half, two, you know, Alexander's is important to me. The final, the ultimate cut, I had a, quite a problem on that film. But the ultimate cut of Alexander is closest to, in a way, who I am. And also the heaven and earth, although it's far from me in the sense of the character was Lei Hayslip, a woman in Vietnam, a Vietnamese peasant. And her story, it's a very moving story. Those are two pictures that are completely misunderstood and vanished. But, you know, those are the ones sometimes you love the most. JFK, I, I love because it's so ambitious. And I'm, so, I'm glad it's made because it's a real protest movement. It's, it's uh, Zola-esque, Zola you know. Uh, I love uh, 
Nixon, which is another kind of forgotten movie. Nixon is a very interesting movie about a gigantic man who with so many flaws, but it's done with love. It's not done with pointing the finger as he's saying he's a bad guy. No, it's a very human movie. And I love Nixon, but these movies kind of vanish. They vanish in the memory. That's the problem, you know, but you have the EBFI, you have institutes like yep. yours. There is an archive of these things and they are available. So perhaps another generation would, would appreciate it. Chasing the Light is now available to buy in shops. And thanks to our friends at Octopus Books, we've signed copies of the book at the BFI shop. And for a limited time, we're also giving you five pounds off the cover price while stocks last. Just go to bfi.org.uk forward slash shop and use the code STONE5 at the checkout. And all that remains is, is me. Thank you very much for joining us today, Oliver. It's my pleasure. It's been fun talking to you. And Thank congratulations you. again on the book. Appreciate it. And finally, if you enjoyed this event, please consider donating to the BFI. They're a charity and their venues have closed again due to the current lockdown. So your donations will help with their work across the film and television industries. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Ian.